it's a great step forward because all that flexibility provides opportunity for people to think again, to try again, to be someone else at some different time. Whether Ned Kelly would even recognise Melbourne or any part of it, I suspect he would be utterly bewildered what he would make of RMIT or the Working Men's College, what he would make of all the familiar surrounds that we take for granted, let alone the institutions and infrastructure where we just have no idea. But it's a tempting scenario, a very tempting scenario that we'll play some more with in just a moment as we discuss here with the panel whether or not Ned Kelly might have been better reading rather than fighting, better read than dead, and how would educational opportunity, if RMIT existed before it was too late for Ned Kelly, how that may have changed not only his, but all of Victoria's history too. We're in the Old Melbourne Magistrates Court broadcasting on Channel 31 and to the camera and the screen at Federation Square for this hypothetical sponsored by RMIT University. Welcome back to the Old Melbourne Magistrates Court where we're conducting a hypothetical about Ned Kelly's future. I'm John Fain, you're on Channel 31 and at Federation Square as well as our live audience here at the Old Melbourne Magistrates Court. Looking at the prospects of Ned Kelly having had a different life if things had gone for him slightly differently if RMIT University in its then form as the Working Men's College had been opened seven years earlier. Lex Lasry QC, as a barrister you've defended some pretty desperate and shady characters in every sense of the term. Would an education have helped some of them? Is there a correlation between educational opportunities and crime? I think there's no doubt that um, opportunity to earn a legitimate living is a disincentive to uh, uh, embark on a life of crime and plenty of my clients have embarked on a life of crime because uh, the rewards came quickly. Uh, all you had to do was pull a gun in a bank, uh, get the $50,000 and uh, there you were. Uh, and then you conducted a war with the police or they conducted a war with you. Uh, I think by and large, if you looked at the figures, and I haven't, John, but I think if you did, you'd see that looking at crime overall, people who turn to crime, particularly these days in, in a drug environment, do so out of a sense of desperation and urgent financial need. A lot of the biggest crimes are committed by people in suits, not boiler suits, aren't they? That's a bit unfair, John, really. Um, <laughs> they have to wear a suit to court, um, but they're not wearing suits necessarily when they commit the offence. I'm talking um, about I know what you're talking crime. About. Yes, I know you're talking about white. Of course, yeah, of course. I mean, in the in the 20th and 21st century, there's there's fraud, uh, quite substantial fraud committed by people in suits, as you say. But the sort of crime we're talking about with Ned Kelly is a product, I think, of his environment and an ongoing conflict with the police, which was a conflict with his family as well as with him. Uh, that's a sort of traditional type of relationship, I think. The grimmest view you can have of the criminal justice system is that it's really just a sponge for mopping up society's flotsam and jetsam. How accurate is that? Well, I don't know whether, they, whether the criminal justice system mops them up, um, except to the extent that it deals with them and puts them in prison. Uh, the criminal justice system is, and has been for a long time, overloaded. Uh, and look, criminal activity by and large is a symptom of our community. And it, as it increases, I suspect that underpins a, a problem with aspects of our community and the way we live. In those days, uh, and certainly in Ned Kelly's case, whatever else you might say, he would certainly say there was victimisation of him and his family and that that in itself precipitated criminal activity and then he wound up in the courts and was, I would say, uh, pretty harshly dealt with and of course something dear to my heart, at the end of the process he was hanged, uh, an appalling punishment. Simon Brown Greaves, what's your view on the relationship between criminality, a criminal state of mind, and educational opportunity? I think it's sort of a raw material, John, that in a case like Ned, everything we read and see would suggest that there is no evidence that there was an inherent or born tendency to crime. And indeed, uh, I suspect if he'd ended up in prison at the age of 14 or 15 for his first stint, he probably would have been assessed as a young man with great potential and one who would have been, in this day and age, plugged into an educational program very promptly in the prison system, probably with an opportunity to uh, embark on a trade. And uh, I know some people probably find that a bit horrifying, but he probably could have got a good education through the RMIT outreach program into Pentridge. Yes, but all this business about university, the uni what is it, prisons, the University of Hard Knocks, the School of Hard Knocks, I'm not sure what you learn in prison. Lex Lasry, what do you learn in prison if you're sent there at an early age? Uh, well, I, I, look, I think in Ned Kelly's case, he learned he didn't want to go back there. I mean, I, as I understand it, he spent some time in Pentridge and at the end of that was determined to, to live a legitimate life. Uh, and I think a lot of young people, if they're treated properly, 
realise that prison is not the place for them because the alternative is that they learn a whole lot of other skills which they're then tempted to put into effect when they're released. And that's the very thing you don't want to happen. You want... The, the problem, John, is that the real influence in sentencing ought to be on rehabilitation, particularly with young people. And, uh, and yet there's it, precious little of it in the, in the system today, let alone back then. I think... Well, I think there was probably none of it then. No, um, what you and, learned uh, was how to commit bigger crimes from bigger criminals. Well, I think that's still true. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's the temptation, that to get on in prison, you pick up some skills that can be used for illegal rather than proper purposes on your release. I think that's a problem. Verity, can you give us an insight into what prison conditions were like back in Ned Kelly's time? Oh, um, well, pretty awful. I mean, the worst thing was deprivation of freedom. And for somebody like, uh, like Ned, that obviously, uh, he suffered that greatly. Uh, the conditions as now uh, are deliberately there as a deterrent. It's a deterrent, but at the same time, it was a way of life for some people. Recidivism was rife, and recidivism rates were even worse then than they are now. They're bad enough now, but back then they were nothing short of scandalous. And as you learn now, you go into prison for a minor crime, you come out having graduated from the criminal university, or Pentridge University, as some used to call it back here in the old days. Back then it must have been horrendous. Well, certainly there weren't programs then to uh, allow for the greater possibility of rehabilitation. But, I mean, I think Ned, if he'd been jailed um, later on, might well have benefited from a social sciences degree. I think he showed a great sociological imagination that was far superior to his metalworking skills. Um, for instance, he, he made the point that men are made mad by ill treatment. He also argued that the squatters would have better controlled the problem if they had subscribed a fund to help the poor selectors rather than giving uh, rewards for policemen to capture cattle duffers and, and so on. And he also even very astutely made the uh, comment that the police system had an interest in outlawry and the sort of crime that comes from endemic social conflict. Well, if he hadn't shot a couple of policemen, I suppose the bottom line is he wouldn't be in the dock here today. One reason for Kelly's social exclusion and disadvantage lay in his Irish Catholic heritage. Walid Ali, back to you as a member of the Islamic Council of Victoria in your book, People Like Us, you write about social exclusion. Do religion and ethnicity still act as barriers for newcomers in Australian society? Have we moved on? Oh, no, not at all. I mean, there's no doubt that they, they still act as, as barriers to um, inclusion. Uh, but it's not, I mean, it's... We've, we've got a sectarian history in this country. You only need to ask um, people of Catholic background um, what, what their parents experienced in this country, and I'll, I'm sure, tell you and be happy to do so. Um, we've, we've had experiences of, of exclusion through race, through immigration and so on. We, we've got all these things in our history. The question is um, to what extent they rise to prominence uh, again. And I would argue that under certain circumstances, particularly uh, politically active circumstances where there's heat in, in the political conversation, such as now, uh, they come back up to the surface. Um, so it's about the conditions for them. It's quite comical, in fact, these days to think about the sort of taunts that our parents' generation and even some of us would have seen in the schoolyard, the fact that uh, political parties were divided over which version of Christianity. I mean, given the divisions in society now are over somewhat different schisms, it's, uh, it's almost a must to make you just wonder whether we've moved much at all or just shifted around some of the labels. John Rawlinson, if you go to prison, what are your job prospects afterwards, even today? Look, it's, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't help, but uh, we... Uh, and it certainly wouldn't have helped back then, but uh, I guess it depends on um, what your uh, crime was and uh, depends on, um, you know, your, uh, your ability to, to, to demonstrate that you have, uh, you have reformed. And I guess it sort of depends on your skills. We are in an environment right now where we have extreme shortages of workers and... Uh, and particularly uh, uh, skills and, and professions. So uh, I think that uh, you know, if, if that there's never been a better time to uh, to have a, a criminal record and get back into the into the work, into the job market than there is uh, there is right now. And, never and been a, a better time to have a criminal record, ladies and gentlemen. That's and, something uh, really to be reassured by. Um, and, and I think you know we we would encourage um, any employer to uh, to perhaps look beyond the uh, the past. Uh, track record and look at future future potential, but uh, but clearly it uh, it's not going to help.
Well, they say if you do the crime, you do the time, but then you should be able to get on with your life. Alan Montague, how hard is it to get an apprenticeship if you disclose a criminal past? It does 